day we're gathered in your name calling out to your glory like a fire awakening desire burn our hearts with truth So what I said was, uh, to, to, in order to get to uh, the restaurant, you have to go this way and make a right. No, I really didn't say that. I'm Brad. I'm one of the pastors. It's, it's great to be here to, with you today. We thank God for each of you, whether you're here in person or online. We pray uh, God's blessing on you. Um, as you came in today, uh, and, and this is really for folks who are... Uh, who have uh, been here before, not, uh, guests are going to say, what, what's going on around here? But we, um, we're really serious about uh, making an impact for God in our world, for Jesus Christ in our world, because we've been touching our hearts with what life is all about in Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and so we've been talking about the impact we want to make in the next couple of years. Uh, we've been talking about the heroes of faith uh, back then that empowers us to be heroes of faith now. Uh, and in connection with all that, we, we pass out these impact cards. The, the, the first panel talks about taking a step uh, uh, in growing in our giving. This, this, the Bible calls it a grace, a gift of God to be able to, to, to be generous in his mission. Um, and, and Jesus gently leads us to take these steps 
Um, and and you, can, you can look through this and see how God is guiding you. I know that um, whenever I do this, it's, uh, it's a wonderful gift of grace from God because he always leads me in a place I haven't gone. And he always kind of knocks me upside the head with something I got to fix. And the thing that he knocked me upside the head with this year is um, you, you read through this thing and there's a big number in there. It says this is what we want to, to receive to do the mission of God for the next couple of years. And for some reason, in my pride, I always think that I've got to do it. But I can't do it. And God's really been working with me, saying, no, 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 no. It's, it's about my family in that place doing it together. I'll lead you where I want to lead you so that, so that your heart grows, where your treasure is, so will your heart be also. But you let me work with everyone, and together, I'll get you where you need to be. So that's how God's been working with me. And, and I, I know that he'll work with you as you work through the card. We have an early commitment service tonight. Uh, you can be part of those who lead us forward. Or if you're not quite ready, you can be praying about it and thinking about it. We'll, we'll do it on the 20th here on Sunday as well. Um, so a, a great um, tool to lead us to take a step closer to God. Can I get an amen? Cool. All right. I... Um, I'm afraid I need my glasses in there. So I, I was thinking about today, and this passage hit, hit my head. And I, I just want to read it to you a little bit. It's in Romans, and, and it says, Therefore I urge you, brother, therefore, it points back to everything Jesus did, right? Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And... and you know, I don't know what it is. It may, maybe it's just me, but I think it's part of our, uh, the, the American reality in which we live, which is awesome, good stuff, right? We stand on our own two feet, uh, and, and we're responsible, and we do it ourselves. And so we read this, and we say, yeah, this is between Jesus and me, that I've got to do this great stuff. I've got to give him my body as a living sacrifice, and I've got to do great stuff. But this is the context of giving our bodies to Jesus in a living sacrifice. For by the grace given me, the gift given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more higher than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Okay, so, so what am I supposed to not be prideful about? Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. And so how we give our bodies a living sacrifice is in the community, is in the ecclesia, because God has given each of us gifts. He says, don't think of yourself more highly than you are. Don't think you can live it alone. Don't think it can be just Jesus and me. Don't think you can accomplish great things in the kingdom just by yourself. That's not the way I put things together, Jesus says. And the amazing thing about this section is it, it kind of flows into this love must be sincere. Well, where does love come into it? That's what we give each other. Because you ever notice we're not perfect? Yeah. And it says, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly and sisterly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Uh, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. And all of this is in the context of God's people. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Our confession of sin is we always seem to want to go our own way. We forget that sin is the thing that finally divides us and separates us. It makes us alone. Jesus brings us together. His blood washes us clean. He calls us into a fellowship, into a family, into the ecclesia. Today, as we bring this confession of sin to him, I declare to you that you will wash clean in the blood of Jesus Christ, that he renews who you are in the people of God and empowers you to joyfully receive the gift and live in it. This I declare to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all God's people say, Amen. Yes.
couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fade, never enough. And you came along, put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid. Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountains is the God of the valley. There's not a place you
Nice clapping, by the way. That was great clapping. You guys nailed your part.
give these guys a hand today. They're incredible. Before you sit down, will you give a high five or a handshake or a hug even, if you're a hugger, to the people next to you? But don't make it awkward. And at this time, we're going to invite all of our kiddos to come forward. All the kids, come on down for the children's message. This is your time. Come on down, guys. Hey, how you doing? Come on up. Oh, I got to turn this around like this. Everybody here? All right. So you got to turn around so you can see this, okay? Do you know this guy? Somebody tell me who that is. Yeah. Batman. Batman. Do you like Batman? Yeah. Pretty good. Wouldn't you, I, he, I'd love for him to be my friend, especially if, if I'm in danger, huh? Take a look. Take a look at those pistons for his arms, huh? Look at those shoulders. This guy's strong, man. If he was your friend, you wouldn't ever worry about it, about, about being protected, right? He'd be right with you. He's a superhero, right? Do you guys, do you have any other superheroes, one you can think of that you like? My favorite one is Spider-Man. You like Spider-Man? I think the reason I like him is because he can fly, baby, you know? And, 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 the, and he'll come in the nick of time and he'll rescue you, right? I love his, you know, superheroes, you know, kids your age know them all over the world. I was in a place called Hungary, and I brought a, a, a picture of Spider-Man, and all the kids knew, thought, knew him. That's Spider-Man. They didn't say it in English, but he said, that's Spider-Man. They, they knew him. Everybody knows superheroes, huh? Because it's really cool, and we all want superheroes in our lives. We all want people there to protect us and to help us and to guide us. But superheroes are make-believe, right? They're make-believe. But we all have one great superhero. You know who that is? Tell me who you think that is. Just a guess, because we're in church and we talk about him every Sunday. Who do you think that is? You know the guy that, that went the, that did the cross deal? Died on the cross for the Guinness of Sins? Who is that guy? Rose again. You ever hear of this guy? Rose from the dead? Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. It's Jesus. Thank you. Yeah. It's Jesus. He's our superhero, right? And he says, he not only just died on the cross, he rose again. So he's with us every single day. He was strong enough to even beat death. He's, a, he's stronger than any superhero. And he's always with us to help us and protect us and to guide us. But here's what I want you to remember. Because Jesus is with us, he helps every single one of us to be a superhero to the people around us. He helps us to do that by loving them and helping them and sharing Jesus with them and always being their friend. And that starts at home, mom and dad, brother and sister, right? Did you ever think of yourself as a superhero? You are. Every single one of us can be a superhero because Jesus is with us and he helps us to love people in his name. Will you pray with me? Pray after me, ready? Dear Jesus, we thank you that you're our superhero. And we thank you that you help us to be a superhero to those around us in your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Remember, Jesus is a superhero. He is real and true. And you can be a superhero every day by loving people like he does. Okay, we got children's shirts out the door. We got uh, junior high and high school. You can, uh, are they following you, Matt? They're following Matt? All right. Uh, and, and we got Pastor Nathan. Give a hand up for Pastor Nathan. Good morning. You know, we have a cafe out there and they have espresso. Uh, good morning. There we go. All right. Uh, we're in our series, uh, Heroes of Faith, in this series. We are, are talking about uh, these great heroes of faith 
that have gone before us, uh, people that we would look up to, people that we would admire, people uh, that lived incredible lives. But what I believe is that these people lived incredible lives, most importantly because they were connected to God and connected to Jesus. And because of God's power at work in their lives, they did incredible things. And that we can too. And as we get started, I've got a, a question for you. What story are you writing? Are, are you writing a story where you're the star? Or where all the spotlights are on you and you are the designer of your own destiny? Or are you an extra in somebody else's story? Are you writing a story that is shareable on social media, that is to be envied, and you spend your time crafting the, the perfect image that you want to put up for everyone to see. We all want to have a good story, a story that feels worth living, a, a story of significance, a, a story of importance, one that we look on from years down the road and say, man, wasn't that great? And I guess the question, the thought that I, I want to leave with you, the, the thing that I want to guide you as we dive into this topic, because I'm going to make an assumption because you're here on a Sunday morning instead of, well, it's kind of rainy outside. This is probably the best place to be. Um, but because you're here, I'm going to assume that you want a good story that includes Jesus. And so I want this thought to guide us as we think this morning. Are you trying to write your story or help your kids write theirs? Or are you letting God weave your story into the greatest story ever told? Because I believe all of us can have an incredible, a great story if we place our stories and the author of all things, and the story of God. Well, you know, let's start with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we wrestle with things this morning, wrestle with the stories of our lives and what you would have them be, Lord, we ask that you would guide us this morning, help our thoughts to reflect you and your grace, and Lord, help us to recognize what you are doing through us, in our world, even right now. Amen. So I got to preach on this topic, on David's Mighty Men, because I have a nephew named Benaiah. Anybody else know anybody named Benaiah? Yeah. Oh, we got one. Woohoo! Great name. Interesting name. But it, it comes from one of David's Mighty Men in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 23. And, and honestly, these guys are kind of a byline. But the reason they're a byline is because they're connected to that greatest story ever told. And they're remembered, names like Benaiah and other names that I can't pronounce, because they were used by God to do great things. So here from 2 Samuel chapter 23. During harvest time, three of the 30 chief warriors came down to David at the cave of Adullam while the band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Raphim. At that time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison at Bethlehem, that's David's home, by the way. So the three mighty warriors, nope, jumping ahead, sorry about that. David longed for a drink of water, and he said, Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate at Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, Lord, to do this, he said. Is, is it not the blood of men who went at risk of their lives, and David would not drink it? Such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. What a crazy story. And so here we've, we've got some lessons that we can learn uh, from these guys about how do we write great stories. And the first lesson that we find here is to live for something bigger than yourself. 
But that's not what our world would tell us, is it? Our world would tell us, live for yourself. Live comfortably, enjoy life, and the most important thing is that you enjoy life. Or or alongside those lines, if you pick the right career, you can never work a day in your life. I think that's the greatest lie that our college students are told because I've worked, it's work. And I do something that I love. We are called to live for something bigger than ourselves. If we are looking to fill ourselves for our own satisfaction, we're always going to be disappointed. It was put into us, a desire to live for something bigger than ourselves. And instead of trying to quiet that and hush it down with with consumerism and enjoyment and pleasure, God would say, recognize that you were designed for a bigger purpose, to be part of something bigger. Perhaps you remember a time when you were on a sports team or or part of a drama or a play and the thrill that came from being part of something bigger than yourself, doing something that you couldn't accomplish on your own. It's a kind of accomplishment that kind of fills your soul. And the second thing that we learn is it's okay if others think you're crazy. They risk their lives for a bucket of water. (laughs) That's nuts, right? That is crazy. But sometimes those are the best stories. I'll never forget the time when I was in the military and we were out in the field and field food is not great. And we ordered pizza. And the Domino's guy showed up to an intersection And then dark, shadowy figures in uniform appeared out of the dark forest at 9 o'clock at night. I will never forget that and the terror on his face when we approached from the darkness. What an incredible story. You see, we are called to live for something. And sometimes it's okay if it's crazy. We're called to have a mission. We need a mission. And Jesus invites us to be part of that mission. You see, what David was after when he asked for a drink of water... He was longing for something more than was in that water. What did he really want? He wanted home. He wanted home. He wanted to be set up at his hometown, in his home place, drinking water from the well that he knew that he grew up with. He wanted to be home. Have you ever tried to go back home? Anybody ever do that? Have a place that they grew up and you're like, I'm going to go back home and it's going to be great. I grew up in this small town in Minnesota, population 4,638. That was what was on the sign when we drove in. Wyndham, Minnesota, and, and we had blue laws, and so there was only one place that was open on Sundays, and usually we go to this Chinese restaurant on Sunday afternoons because we, my dad worked in the church, and so we go to the one open restaurant that was called this extravagant Chinese name called China. And we would go in there, and man, I remember this Chinese food, and remembering it was so great, and so we flew back to Minnesota a few years ago uh, on the way for a baptism, and I take my family to China, and we have Chinese food. Wow, is it awful. (laughs) It had no flavor, no taste. I had the General Tso's chicken, no spice. It's like, this is not right. Something is wrong. And you remember home in a certain way, and you go back there, and it's not there. The thing you're looking for isn't there. The thing is a thing. It's it's attached to a greater thing, a, a home that we all long for. And it's a home that we've been given in Jesus Christ. From Colossians chapter 1. Picking up a little bit early in verse uh, 9, we have not stopped praying for you so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you might have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father 
who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued you from the dominion of darkness and brought you us into the kingdom of the Son that he loves. You have been moved from a kingdom of darkness into God's eternal kingdom of light. Jesus Christ, with his very blood, has bought you, purchased you, and transformed you into a new kingdom. Made you an heir, a son and daughter of the king. And he has invited you to join him on that mission, to be part of that mission, to grab and forcefully drag people from the kingdom of darkness into his kingdom of light. You have that as part of your identity as a child of God. We have a mission as his people, whether we want to recognize it or realize it or not. We have a mission as God's people. The next thing that we learn from this text is don't go it alone. We live in a world that encourages us to go it alone, that it encourages us to, to be the masters of our own destiny. As I was thinking about this this morning, I couldn't help but the images from the movie The Gladiator popped into my mind. We all want to have this story where we're the champion on our own and our world tells us that you can do it, you can accomplish it, you can be all that you want to be. But that's not ever how God invites or encourages his people to go about it. He always draws us together, makes us as part of a, of a bigger community. A little while back, we did the Being Challenge. And one of the things was commit to community. I remember the question, can you think of a time and a great accomplishment you had by yourself? And one that you did with other people. And so I started thinking of, of my time as a runner, which was about 50 pounds ago. And... And I thought, yeah, that's an individualistic sport, and I, I liked it because I could, I could, you know, know that I accomplished something, know that I did something good, and I kind of accomplished, no, I didn't accomplish that on my own. I had a coach, and I had teammates, and I had people that ran with me, I had, I had people that helped me train. We worked together. It was not something I did on my own, but it was something I accomplished with others, and as I thought about my life, anything that I have ever accomplished would be less if it weren't for the other people that God had placed in my life that helped me along the way. We are meant to do things together. It's why we at St. Matthew talk about creating friendships. That is, growing in Christ through God's word in authentic relationships. We need Christian friends. People who believe in Jesus. People who want to walk with Jesus. And people who walk beside us. I have people whose names I still know, people who I still talk to, because my parents were in a life group with their parents when I lived in Colorado Springs and was seven years old. That's crazy. God has designed us for relationship and connection, and when we have that and when we find that, our lives are richer and fuller and better. And yet we live in a world that is continually pushing against that. Saying, Here, here's some entertainment. I entertain yourself. I enjoy life. It's been this incredible transformation that I think COVID pushed to a whole new level. Where, where I feel like people don't even understand or, or really, they've lost the ability to interact and engage with others. One of my favorite things is I go to the gym, and, and after working out the gym, I love to go sit in the sauna and sweat. And it used to be you'd go in there, and you'd have these incredible conversations with people that you'd never meet to or never talk to otherwise. And you have these great conversations, but the craziest thing is now you go in the sauna, and everybody's on their phones. I don't think that that's good for that thing. <laughs> people don't talk anymore. And the challenge is that it's not just there, it's everywhere. It's in the line at the grocery store or at Home Depot. It's around the kitchen table. It's, it's with friends gathered together in a restaurant. 
We're meant to do life together and we live in a world that encourage us to do it apart. You know, there's a David's son, Solomon, who wrote these incredible words in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And I, I, can't, I can't help but wonder if not immediately, but maybe four or five years later, David came home and said, hey, Solomon, hey, sons, listen to this great story. You know those guys, the three guys? You won't believe what they did when we were camped over there, and they went down to Bethlehem and got me water. And I wonder if that story is playing in the back of Solomon's mind as he writes these words. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. You hear the three and you can't wonder, help but wonder, you know, was, was Solomon thinking about this crazy story that his dad told him? Uh, we as, as Christians talk about that a lot in, in marriage and how when God joins us together, the other part of our relationship, because we're all connected to Jesus, is Jesus in that relationship. And that's absolutely true, but I can't help but wonder, was Solomon thinking of this story that his dad told him about three crazy guys? You know, that's the model that is over and over and over again laid down in Scripture, and yet too often we want to be lone rangers or encouraged to be lone rangers, even in the church. We'd send out a solo guy to church plant and we'd say, good luck. It's something that we were to do together. It was, it was Jesus' pattern. Jesus himself, he, he goes up on a mountain to pray, and any time that Jesus is praying, he's about to do something really important. Jesus went up onto a mountainside, called to him those who he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons, to push back the darkness and the brokenness and the evil in our world. These are the 12 he appointed, Simon to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, the sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Jesus, the very son of God, did life with other people and was on mission with others and then gathered them together to send them out together. Because how did he send them out? He sent them out two by two. Send them out, not as lone rangers, but with others. It's about being together. And then in Acts, we see exactly the same thing, that the, the earliest disciples of Jesus pattern their lives in the same way. From Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many signs and wonders the apostles performed. All the believers were together. That's such a powerful word. And had everything in common. They really did life with one another. Can you think of a time in your life when you can remember being really together with someone else? or a group of people, and the power that came from that. This isn't really here, but it's one that just kind of screams at me, mostly because I've messed this up. Uh, and that is wait on God. Th that, I think, is the, the fourth principle, that, that, that we as followers of Jesus must first and foremost look to him as we seek to write great stories and not try and write it on our own. Has anybody ever gone after something that they thought they were supposed to do in their own timing and their own power? How did it go? <laughs> I see a lot of, yeah. I, I've done that. It's bad. I, I just, one name. Moses, right? How did that end when he tried to do it on his own? With a guy buried in a shallow grave with sand. 
And then his own people not even trusting him. Like, it did not go well for him when he tried to do it on his own. And so we as, as followers of Jesus are called to look to him for guidance, uh, to look for him for, for his timing, to look to him for his power. And you see, it's all about doing it together with other people because we need people to remind us of the mission. We need people to remind us, hey, you're not crazy. We're all crazy. We need people to, to grab us and pull us in when we're tempted to go off on our own way. We need people to remind us and look for and wait for God's timing and his power and his guidance to show up. And when we're doing it on our own, we can say, yeah, I'm doing what God wants. Until somebody comes in and they say, wait a second, what are you doing here? No, no. You don't get the blessing of God by going against the commands of God. That's not the way this works. We need people in our lives. People who know Jesus and who are given permission to speak into our lives because otherwise what happens? We end up broken and alone. That text from Matthew, we can read it two ways. Either, either when we gather together, Jesus shows up, but we can also read it the other way, that it is Jesus is the only reason that we can get together as people. Think about it in your relationship with your spouse. If it weren't for Jesus, would there be some things you'd have trouble forgiving them for? Would there be some things without forgiveness that would just make your life hard? Because I know my wife, she puts up with a lot. She forgives me a lot. And that's how we're together. Is because of Jesus. And I think that's true for all of our relationships. We're called to do life together. The last point I think is, is kind of difficult. And so I want to I get at this one with a question. And the question is this, when did we allow evil to become stronger than us? Some of you may recognize the movie, but when did we allow evil to become stronger than us? We have a world that encourages us to be afraid and to be fearful. And I know coming into election, this one might be a little on the nose but I don't want you to hear your organization is bad and you should listen to mine. But I think you need to see this. Somebody else posted this coming into the election. Dear Christian friend, if your preferred news source stokes your fear, anger, and encourages hatred towards others rather than inspiring you to want to learn more, empathize and understand, then it is discipling you in the opposite direction from the love of Jesus. And I'm not saying your three-letter organization is mine is bad and you should tune into mine. Not what I'm saying. I think they're all bad. And they all talk about fear and anger and hatred. I heard a guy at a TED Talk, and I should tell you who he was because it's not my thought. He said, the news is always the same. It's a spotlight in the jungle saying, look, there's an antelope being eaten by a tiger. Whoa! Whoa! But at the very moment that that's happening, there's also beautiful things that are happening as well in the jungle. But the news doesn't go there. It always goes to the terrible and the awful stuff, the stuff that makes you fearful and afraid and angry. It says the news is the same. Like I said, I stopped watching it 17 years ago. The story's the same. It's just happening to different people now. We're allowing the world to pour into us things that, that focus our minds and, and push our emotions in the wrong ways. What I'm really saying is, is are you seeking God more than you're listening to the voices of this world? The voices of this world that would drive you away from Jesus and his grace and his power and his mission. That's 
what I'm saying? Do we have a greater source of power in our lives that we need to tune into? And what I'm really saying is, we need to remember the story. The story is we win. The story is that Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, who is nailed to the cross, who, when everybody who was following Jesus was looking on at that very moment, said there is nothing good that's ever going to come out of this. And at that very moment, God was doing his greatest good for the world. Don't you believe that he can do the same in your life? Jesus Christ, the risen one who has overcome death and the grave. That's the worst thing they can do to you, right? They can kill you. Terrible thing. But you have a Savior who has redeemed you, purchased you, given you new life in him, and on the last day, you will rise. We have a Savior. And yes, our world is broken. Yes, there are things that are wrong. And if we tune into the news cycle, we think that if the wrong guy gets elected, it's all going to hell. But the sun still rose today. The leaves are changing colors, and it is beautiful outside. My kids are great, even though we're sick this morning. But life is good, and creation is still good, and Jesus Christ is still on the throne. And one day, that same Jesus is going to return and the kingdom of our God and the kingdom of this world are going to become one and the same and we win. We win and we get to be part of that here and now. He invites us into this mission to be more than we ever thought we could be and because of that, our lives are not insignificant but filled with eternal purpose by his grace close with these powerful words from Colossians. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in him everything, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on heaven or things, things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus is reconciling all things onto himself, and he's inviting us to be part of that and to grab someone else. Say, you're on this mission with me. We're on this together. We have God on our side. Amen. You know, as we continue, it's also fitting that we should come before our God in prayer. A couple weeks ago, I heard something, somebody say something great. He said, when we come to God in prayer, when we, we proclaim his word, God always shows up and always does something. And sometimes he does everything. And so now uh, we come before our God in prayer, uh, praying for, for those that are hurting in our midst, and praying for um, our world, especially at this time as we prepare for elections. As we get ready for communion, if you have something on your heart that you would love to have prayed for, we'll have people at the prayer banners. And as, as you come to communion, if you want prayers for anything, anything going on in your life, we have a God that would long to be near to you. Hear those prayers. And show up that you may find comfort and peace in him. Please join me in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we as your people know that we are going to see a victory. 
That, that victory may not look like we, what we expect or what we hope for, but we know that you love us and that you are working in the midst of this fallen and broken world. Uh, that you are redeeming all things. And Lord, we especially pray for those whose life is hard because of illness or sickness or, or broken relationships. And Lord, we ask that, that you would show up. That you would show up in your grace and your power especially knowing that it is in weakness that we are the strongest as we are forced to trust in you, the God and creator of all things. And Lord, we pray for our world, our, our world that is at broken, our, our world that is at war, our, our world where, where people are hungry and victims of violence and atrocity. And Lord, we ask for your peace for your power and your guidance and your wisdom, your spirit to settle upon pe people, leaders, uh, that you have given authority and power that your reign may come and peace may come to our world. And Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for, for the leaders that, that you would put in place through elections and the power of the people. And Lord, we ask that, that you would give us vision to see you at work, that, that you would allow us as your people to lay our hearts before you to seek your guidance and how we should vote and, and how we should live as, as citizens in our country. And Lord, help us to be good neighbors, to love those that live across the street and around the corner and right beside us, that we may touch people's hearts and lives with your grace right where you have placed us. Gracious Lord, we pray all these things, praying as you taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. That Jesus started uh, Holy Communion. And it tells us he did it on the night he was going to die, on the night he would be arrested, on the night he was betrayed. And, and so he had these 12 guys at the table, and they would turn the world upside down. That's what they do, right? They would turn the world upside down, but that night they were a motley crew. Their enemies called them unschooled, ordinary men. There was Matthew, the tax collector, who betrayed his own people. There was Simon, the zealot, who wanted to kill all the Romans. There was these sons of thunder who wanted to call down fire to destroy villages if they didn't listen to him. They were a motley crew, and they would all run away from him that night. And he said, this is my body, this is my blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. They would be forgiven they would be restored, they would be empowered, and they would turn the world upside down. Today in Holy Communion, Jesus is present. This is my body, this is my blood. He's here to wash us clean in his blood, to forgive us, to restore us, to empower us, to turn the world upside down together as his people. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of you all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. We stand and we confess this faith that we know in Jesus with Christians from 1,700 years ago in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Come, for all is now ready. Thanks be to God. You may be seated, and as the ushers uh, excuse you, you may come forward and receive this gift of the body and blood of Jesus to redeem, restore, and strengthen you to turn the world upside down.
as an anchor for my soul through every storm I will hold to you so in in this moment we all sat at his table. He gave us his body and blood through which our sins are washed away and are renewed, restored, and empowered to turn the world upside down. May this body broken and blood shed strengthen and preserve you in the true faith to life never ending depart in his peace and joy. Amen. So, um, just uh, you want to put that up for me real quick? Uh, just a, a moment here. We're going to talk. Uh, we we to call this the offering moment. And I don't know if you were around here the last couple of days. Um, we did a thing called Maker's Marketplace, and I used that we magisterially because I didn't do anything to do it, right? Uh, um, it was, but we had so many people involved in making these things and being here, and it was a wonderful community event. Uh, just some wonderful things happened, and. A whole, a whole lot of money w was raised uh, for Acres of Hope, which is a wonderful organization that connects with families and prevents homelessness. Uh, and and we've, we've poured many resources into them, but yesterday we were able to, to pour more resources into them, not because we did something individually, but because we came together. And we accomplished so much more because we came together to do it. That's what... Um, our offerings are all about. Everything we do around here is because we come together. Uh, if the Lord, if His Spirit is leading you to support this ministry, you can do it three ways, uh, online, with your phone, mobile, uh, or in person. We've got the boxes as you leave today, or, or even to, to, you can mail something here. And if not here, brothers and sisters, I would, I would encourage you to support another Christian organization and their mission and ministry. Because finally, this is about our hearts. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Would you pray with me? Uh, dearest Jesus, we thank you for your wonderful example. Uh, you called the 12, and you had a life with them. Um, and, and you taught them that, that, that we do uh, ministry work. We build the kingdom together. We thank you for bringing us together. We thank you that all of your people are tied together and and that we go forward together in, in, in building your kingdom, your ongoing mission to redeem and restore all people. We pray that you would send your spirit to each of us to show us what that means as we look to grow in this grace that you give us. We pray in your name and all God's people say, amen. So just uh, on the back of your card, I, w I wanted to signpost, uh, and I got to do my, you know, they, I got to put my glass on for this, sorry. Um, but we have that early commitment service tonight at 630 uh, for all those who want to lead us forward, uh, we have the combined worship and celebration of ministry. That's next week at 930. So we only have um, one worship in that next week. It'll be in here. Uh, it's kind of, we only do this once, once or twice a year, and we bring everybody together. We have this great time of celebration. We have a meeting in the other uh, worship space uh, uh, to, to celebrate what God has done in the past year and to look forward to the coming year. Uh, it's a great time. Uh, I hope you can be a part of it. Uh, and it, uh, not in this, but not during worship, uh, but, but with the meeting, we'll have child care and the like. Um, that's why this worship will be a shortened worship, uh, uh, so, that, um, so that we're kind to parents as well. All right, so we got, uh, we got Christmas coming up. You can grab the, the whole lineup at the guest table. We have a sheet for you. Uh, but we've got, we, we kind of, we have this thing called a Christmas Carol. It's, it's a production, and, we, and they wanted to use our place. We said, do it. It's a great way to kick off the season. So bring somebody and enjoy it, okay? Uh, um, bring somebody so that they, they know we're here. Uh, and, and then we have the Advent Wednesdays with the, uh, with the soup suppers and, and the whole Christmas lineup. You know, the whole world bubbles up looking for love and joy and peace and hope at Christmas time. And it can only be found one place. A and you know where, and you can share it, and you can bring folks together here. And finally, we have the kids' Christmas production. That's on December 18th in both worship services. Again, you know somebody that loves to uh, enjoy kids like that. Bring them along. See what God will do. 
receive now the blessing of our Lord. May you know joyfully the day by day and certain provision of the Father in your life. May you know in Jesus, the one who will never leave you nor forsake you, even having gone the way of the cross. And may you know the Holy Spirit which daily leads and empowers you to bring this wonderful gift of Jesus into our world. Amen. Show